Welcome to another episode of True Crime Cases. Today, we're unraveling a case that sends chills down our spine and forces us to question our own safety. Today's case happened in Dunedin, nestled on the central eastern coast of Otago, South Island, in New Zealand. Dunedin is a city that's cradled by the head of the Otago Harbor and encircled by hills, remnants of an ancient extinct volcano. Known as the Edinburgh of the South, the city is home to the University of Otago. Dunedin is a relatively small city with an estimated population of around 130,000. In the peaceful suburb of Korstorfi, a new day was dawning. At 9 a.m., Lisa Ann, a devoted mother, stepped into her daughter Amber Rose's room. She found Amber Rose, seemingly in deep sleep, her face hidden beneath a pillow. Lisa nudged her gently, expecting the usual sleepy protest, but silence met her instead. The dark blot on the pillow drew Lisa's attention, a stark anomaly against the pristine fabric. Lisa's heart fluttered with concern, attributing it to a nosebleed. With a sense of foreboding, Lisa lifted the pillow, only to be met with a sight that would forever scar her soul. Amber Rose was lifeless, a sight as traumatic as it was unexpected. With a gaping wound on her neck, this was no ordinary nosebleed. It was a nightmare come true. Lisa's anguished scream shattered the morning tranquility, reverberating through the once peaceful home. Brendan McNee, Lisa's partner, rushed in, his heart pounding. The sight of Amber Rose so still, so pale, shook him to his core. He reached for a pulse, but his worst fear was confirmed. In the ensuing chaos, Jaden, Amber Rose's brother, dialed the ambulance, turning the serene morning into a nightmare. Amber Rose was more than just a tragic headline. She was a vibrant 16-year-old with dreams and aspirations. She worked at a local supermarket, saving every penny to buy her first car. Her dream was to become a police dog handler, a testament to her love for animals and her desire to serve her community. She was a lover of art and the beach, often spending her free time sketching the beautiful New Zealand landscapes. Amber Rose had faced her share of challenges. She left school a year earlier due to cyberbullying, but had made peace with her former tormentors. She was loving life, her mother would later say, a poignant reminder of the vibrant spirit that was extinguished too soon. The investigation into Amber Rose's death brought the police to her family's doorstep. They began by interviewing her family members and her boyfriend. Amber Rose's brother, Jaden, recalled coming home from work with his girlfriend around 12.15 a.m. He noticed the key still hanging in the keyhole and the kitchen lights on. Thinking it was left by his sister, he knocked on her door. When she didn't answer, he assumed she was asleep and retreated to his room to play video games unaware of the tragedy that was unfolding next door. Kristen Clark, Amber Rose's boyfriend, had been communicating with her on the night she died. She had sent him screenshots of a heated exchange with a 30-year-old doctor named Vinod Skantha. Concerned, Clark offered to pick her up, but Amber Rose declined. It was the last message she sent. Worried, Clark went to her house and knocked on her window in the early hours of February 3rd. When there was no response, he left and sent her another message. Chantel Rush, Amber Rose's sister, received a message from Amber Rose on the night of her death, which said, quote, I'm so angry. Chantel only noticed the message the next morning and replied, why? But there was no response. Amber Rose had already passed away. The autopsy report, carried out by pathologist Dr. Kate White, revealed the chilling details of Amber Rose's final moments. She had suffered several wounds to her neck and throat, but the most significant was a wound on the left side of her neck. This wound measured 110 millimeters in length at post-mortem, and within its depths were injuries to other structures. These injuries included a completely severed corroded artery, damage to other blood vessels, and her windpipe being mostly severed. The weapon had gone deep enough to leave marks on the vertebrae. The wound had split her left ear and ran beyond the base of the skull. It was this wound that had been the fatal blow. 
Dr. White estimated the wound to be about five to six centimeters deep at its deepest point. It would have still taken a few minutes for Amber Rose to bleed out. Such was the cruel nature of the attack. Amber Rose had suffered several other injuries during the attack, including two stab wounds to the back of the neck. However, most of these were superficial, and none would have been fatal on their own. The nature of the fatal wound indicated a disturbing fact. The person who did this knew what they were doing. This was a calculated act of violence. As the details of the autopsy report were revealed, the horrifying reality of Amber Rose's final moment sent shockwaves through the community. The question that haunted everyone was, who would want to kill Amber Rose in such a brutal manner? And who was this man Amber Rose was arguing with? The man in question was Dr. Venad Skantha, a 30-year-old known as Vinny. Amber Rose had met Skantha in mid-2017 through mutual friends when she was just 15 years old. Skantha was known to exclusively hang out with teenagers, often hosting parties at his house in Dunedin, where he provided alcohol and sometimes drugs to the teenage guests. Amber Rose had even discussed moving in with Skantha with her sister, Chantel Rush. Chantel had questioned her sister about Skantha's intentions, finding it extremely odd that a 30-plus-year-old man would want teenagers moving in with him. But Amber Rose was not concerned. She saw Skantha as a father figure and was excited about the prospect of living with a doctor. She had even used Skantha's credit card to make an online purchase, brushing it off as just a few dollars that he wouldn't even notice. Chantel, however, was worried. She suggested to Amber Rose that Skantha might be positioning himself as a sugar daddy and that it might be a case of grooming. In a later conversation, Amber Rose mentioned planning to go to Skantha's house with her mother to try to get money out of him, or she would go to the cops. Was she blackmailing him for money? As the police dug deeper into Skantha, a disturbing picture began to emerge. Skantha was a graduate of the University of Auckland Medical School and was working as a junior doctor at Dunedin Hospital at the time. However, his behavior had been deteriorating throughout 2017 as his alcohol consumption increased. He had even turned up to work intoxicated and treated a patient while under the influence. He had narrowly avoided being fired for poor performance in July 2017 by lying to his supervisors that his mother had died unexpectedly. Skantha's increasingly unpredictable behavior had led him into conflict with his friends. One friend, O'Connor, ended up in a fight with Skantha over how he was treating some women friends. Another friend was so angered by Skantha's derogatory comments about some women that he smashed Skantha's BMW wing mirror with a hammer. Amber Rose's conflict with Skantha began in January 2018. After a party at Skantha's home, Amber Rose woke up to find Skantha's hand down her pants and her top and bra removed. She felt she had been drugged. A chilling realization that marked the beginning of a horrifying ordeal. The evening of Amber Rose's murder was a night of fury fear and violence. It began with an argument between Amber Rose and Skantha, sparked by Skantha's confrontation over her use of his credit card. Amber Rose retaliated by accusing him of molesting her in January 2018 and threatening to expose his behavior to the police and his work. She shared some Facebook chat exchange she had with Skantha on Instagram at 11 p.m., alleging that Skantha would turn up to work drunk supply alcohol to minors, and touch them inappropriately. She told him to grow up and said she was going to make sure everyone knew what a sick person he was. She messaged him about his attempts to offer money for sex to her and other teenagers, and said she would tell his work and the police. Skantha pleaded with her to remove the post, but she refused. The terse exchange ended at 11.25 p.m. with Amber Rose telling Skantha, I hope you pay for it, and I hope you go to sleep at night hating yourself." Amber Rose's post caught the attention of Skantha's teenage friend, a 16-year-old who cannot be named. He alerted Skantha of the post and sent him a screenshot. Skantha was furious and worried that he would lose his job and his medical license. 
He called his friend in front of other teenagers and said he would come and pick him up. At 11.39 p.m., a silver BMW belonging to Scantha was captured on CCTV driving towards the Glen in Dunedin, where his friend was waiting. The car drove past the camera again, presumably after picking up his friend. The friend later described Scantha as reasonably chill, not nervous. The friend drove Scantha in his BMW to Amber Rose's house and drew the layout of her house on the car's dashboard. He told Scantha where the spare house key was kept, under a Buddha statue outside the front door. His story meandered and changed through his police interviews and over the three days he spent in the witness box. Dressed in dark clothing and wearing gloves, Scantha entered Amber Rose's Clermiston Avenue home using the spare key. He made his way to her bedroom, where he attacked her with a kitchen knife from his home. He severed her corroded artery and caused damage to her spine and windpipe with a single blow. He also inflicted several other wounds to her neck and throat. When he emerged from the house, he was carrying Amber Rose's phone, license, and a blood-soaked knife. He had a rapidly diminishing window to commit the crime. Amber Rose's boyfriend, Kristen Clark, had arrived sometime after midnight and knocked on her window, but there was no response. Amber Rose's brother, Jaden, and his girlfriend had returned from work around 12.10 a.m. If Scantha had dallied a few extra minutes, he would have been seen by three witnesses. Scantha took Amber Rose's phone, fearing that the incriminating conversations about his behavior could still lead to his career being destroyed, but he accidentally activated its camera function just after midnight as he attempted to smash it on the street outside her home. He disposed of her phone in a swamp at Blackhead Quarry, hoping to delete the exchanges between the pair, but the phone was found, reconstructed, and its data recovered, including the images taken accidentally. The forensic evidence also implicated Scantha, who admitted that it was his teenage friend driving the vehicle. Splatters of Amber Rose's blood were found on the passenger side of the vehicle, thought to have gotten there when Scantha removed his bloodied glove. Blood was also on the sole of his shoes, inside of a bag where he stashed his clothes, and on the passenger side of his car. On the witness stand, his friend testified that Scanta instructed him to clean his car and other items. However, he clearly did a poor job, as investigators were able to uncover Amber Rose's DNA in all those locations several of them showing mixed DNA profiles belonging to Scantha and Amber Rose. The forensic scientist testified that the blood found on Scantha's suede shoes and car window had over a million to one chance to have originated from Amber Rose. Lastly, Amber Rose's blood was found in a bag containing the defendant's clothes. However, none of the defendant's DNA was found in Amber Rose's room itself, likely because he had worn gloves. On February 4th, Scantha, along with the same friend, met with Amber Rose's mother. He brought her flowers and a sorry card, offering condolences and a shoulder to cry on. He was also eager to discuss Amber Rose's death with her, asking her if it could have been a suicide. He then suggested other people may have wanted to end her life, such as her stepdad. Little did he know, another person in the room with them was actually an undercover police officer. Scantha then dropped his friend home, but not before threatening to kill him and his entire family, should he dare reveal anything. However, his friend contacted the police and confessed everything. Coincidentally, Scantha injured his hand while playing with a sword and was on his way to the hospital. He didn't get far and was stopped by the police. During his questioning, Scantha played dumb and played down his past involvement with Amber Rose. He claimed he never had a close relationship with her and only knew her mom. He stated she was just a friend and went to visit her mom out of goodwill because he heard Amber Rose committed suicide. He asked the detectives if they knew her cause of death. When the detectives brought up her allegations on Instagram, he admitted they had a falling out, but because she was drunk and falsely accused him of inappropriately touching her. He claimed she was way too young for him anyway, and he is not a creep. 
he wouldn't spend so much time with a 16-year-old. The detective told him that they had collected cell phone data and other evidence to track his movements on the night of the incident. Scantha then explained his whereabouts on the night Amber Rose died, at one point questioning if his account aligned with the evidence. His explanation lacked clarity and detail, and said he remembers visiting the beach with a teenage friend, the same friend who had called the police and confessed everything. About 30 minutes into the interview, Scantha began interrogating the detective instead, and asserting how preposterous it was that the detective was suggesting he would cause Amber Rose harm over silly Instagram posts. He said he wouldn't jeopardize his whole career and for the detective to really think about this. His desperation, now looking as pathetic as his attempts at denial and manipulation. Scantha then tried another attempt, pointing the finger at his teenage friend, claiming his friend must have committed the crime and set him up instead. He continued to deny all involvement and asked the detective he won't be speaking anymore. Scantha was then promptly arrested. Meanwhile, Lisa Ann was completely devastated by the loss of her daughter. People close to her had said the crime had stolen her soul. She could not bear the pain and grief, and she committed suicide on 11 June 2018, four months after Amber's death. Compounding tragedy that cut so deep in an otherwise peaceful town. Fast forward to the trial on November 4, 2019. The prosecution presented key evidence that Scantha and his friend visited Blackhead Quarry, where Scantha threw Amber Rose's cell phone into the water. However, it was retrieved after police drained the waters and located the phone where his friend said it was thrown. During his trial, a key witness recounted a disturbing encounter Amber Rose had with Scantha at his residence. Initially, he proposed a transaction of $2,000 for sexual favors, which escalated to a staggering $20,000 upon her refusal. In a bold act of defiance, she slapped him and hastily made her exit. Scantha's unsettling infatuation with Miss Rush was described by friends as nothing short of creepy. But the horror doesn't end there. It was revealed that Scantha had a history of offering teenage girls money exchange for sex. The courtroom was left in shock as another witness shared her horrifying experience with Scantha from a night in 2017. She woke up to find herself scantily clad, with Scantha violating her personal space with an older woman also present on the bed. When Scantha proposed a threesome, the witness declined and promptly left. 26 November 2019, Scantha was unanimously found guilty by the jury of murder and four counts of threatening to kill the prosecutor's star witness and their family. He showed no remorse or emotion as the verdict was delivered. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with eligibility for parole after 19 years. Fast forward to 14th April 2021, the New Zealand Court of Appeal dismissed Scantha's appeal and affirmed his conviction. On the same day, Scantha killed himself at the Otago Corrections Facility, the details of which have not been made public. Let us take a moment now to reflect on this truly heartbreaking tragedy, which claimed the lives of teenage girl and her mother, and the scars left on a small community town. This documentary aimed to spotlight the dangers of manipulation, coercion, and the importance of contacting authorities as soon as possible. If you found our content insightful, please comment with your thoughts on this episode, like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon for updates. Your engagement drives us to share more such stories. Stay safe and vigilant. Thank you for joining us.